intricacies of lichen here. And just, just like coral reefs, it kind of this foundation of the ecosystem. There's so much more life in the desert than I think people realize. The origin of the word desert means something like thing abandoned, but you just can't get farther from the truth. The desert's full of life. Uh, you just need to know where to look for it. And where I look is just like right at the soil surface. The layer I study is, is just like this tiny layer of kind of living earth that exists in between the plants in the desert. Some people call it biological soil crust, some people call it biocrust, cryptogamic. I've heard it called fancy dirt before, which I really liked. Western science is really new to deserts. You know, indigenous communities have been interacting with this landscape and understanding it so long before Western scientists arrived. And so Western science is like this newcomer trying to understand these vast and complicated desert ecosystems. Right, like the defining aspect of a desert is that it's dry. And so as a result, plants have to be further apart because they can't be close by because then they would be competing too much for limited water. And so in between the plants is all of this space. And what ended up growing in that space are these biocrust communities. And so they grow and what they're doing is they're just kind of wrapping themselves around the soil, like around the sand grains, that is just basically all the desert is, is sand. And they're creating this web that's literally holding the desert in place. This layering is just, you know, like a few inches thick and it's full of an incredible community of living things. It's like its own ecosystem, its own kind of coral reef of the desert. And it's got these different bacteria and lichens and mosses and things that you would never ever associate with a desert. And they're all right here at the soil surface and they're colorful and they're weird shaped and they kind of mirror the landscape in a really interesting way. Um, and I just really like looking at them. <laughs> These aren't actually, quote unquote, naturally dusty places. Like, the soil is held in place by the biocrusts and the plants that grow here. You get dust storms when those things get disturbed. And so humans coming in and disturbing the landscape is the reason that now the Southwest is dusty. It's not an inherent part of a desert to be dusty. Oh, cool, come check this out. So even though this doesn't look like what we would think of cryptobiotic soil, it absolutely it is. Absolutely is. Yeah, it has, that's all that you're seeing here. All of these things dangling are these cyanobacteria filaments, and so it doesn't need to look any sort of specific way. I don't know that everybody understands how something happening in one place can have such a big effect other places. So what? 
happens in the desert actually has large effects for the whole region. And we're seeing that so clearly with the snowpack and the dust landing there. And here you can see this dust layer, and this is what blew in, unfortunately, um, on the you can see front it space. end of our storm. The dust is making the snowpack absorb more solar radiation than otherwise on a clean, shiny snow surface. There are these processes that happen in deserts. So once disturbance starts, then the things that are holding the desert together, the biocrust, the plants, they stop being able to do that so well, right? So you start getting erosion and you start getting blowing sand. And the more of that you get, the harder it is for the desert to restabilize. So the bigger the area, the more exposed sand, the more disturbance, there's these kind of feedback loops where the desert gets more and more disrupted, you start getting these big consequences. You start getting giant dust storms. You start getting sand dunes. This, this is not a place that has historically had a lot of sand dunes. Yeah, they're beautiful to look at, but blowing sand and loose sand, it means that the desert has been disturbed. And the more of it you see, the more you come to understand that it's not necessarily going back. It's gonna take a lot of work to s put that place back together again. It's all about scale, right? And so if you're coming to Moab and three to three and a half million people are coming here. And even if only a third of those people are, you know, disrupting the desert, even minorly, that's a million people. It's a million people, it's so many people. I think that's really lost on people who come here, how they're part of a bigger picture. I see all these stories of people talking about disturbance in the desert and dust landing on the Rockies, and they kind of end with, um, and there's nothing we can do about these problems, but oh my gosh, there's so much we can do. Um, there are people who are working to restore this biocrust, this like living skin and putting it back out onto the landscape. And, you know, there are ways to not the desert. It's. <laughs> It's not rocket science, you know, just don't just stay on trail. <laughs> it's not that hard, you know. We can enjoy this place and we can do it in a way where we all get to be part of the solution and feel good about ourselves um, while we're here and when we go home to wherever we live. You know, I just don't understand why you wouldn't want to do that. These deserts are alive. Be part of that. <laughs> <laughs>